Yeah, so the microphone is just there, Leslie, yeah. and make sure to turn it on. Okay. We know so there's, yeah, there's a microphone here and there's one there. Um, okay, I'm Leslie Weibel and I'm from Australia. I work with um, the Oscope infrastructure, which is probably a bit like EarthCube. Um, and we have a geochemistry, geochronology program in that. And um, yeah, we're looking to improving how we capture the data from the instruments and um, ensure their preservation through time because a survey we did showed that only 20% of the data collected by our instruments ever sees the light of day. Good afternoon, my name is Mark Middlebusher and I support NOAA, NESDIS, OPA, TIPIO. I'm the database manager that collects information and requirements about NOAA's observing systems. Um, I'm Rose Borden. I will be starting on Monday a job at Sandia National Labs, uh, helping a geophysical group with data management issues. Um, so I, I don't know exactly how much of what they do is field versus lab work, but I thought this might be sort of relevant. I'm Bob Samors, uh, formerly with Belmont Forum, now a senior scholar with the American Association of Universities and Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, working on a public access to research data initiative. Hey, um, Amanda Dean from uh, NOAA's NCEI in Asheville as a metadata specialist. Um, I'm here because I used to be a field scientist, so I'm just very curious about um, this topic. Thanks. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Lemieux from NOAA NCEI, Metadata Specialist. Um, I'm here to learn more about uh, FAIR and uh, see if, I, if there's anything I can apply to my metadata back at NOAA. And I'm Chad Trabant. I'm from Iris Data Services, and we operate probably the world's largest archive of publicly accessible seismic data. And we're really interested in, of course, facilitating researchers to be able to do FAIR to make sure FAIR from the long-term perspective of the data in 10, 20, 50 years is still reachable and findable, accessible. So as a facility as well. And I would like to invite the uh, online remote participants. Uh, Sophie, can you introduce yourself? Does it, does it work with the microphone somehow? I think all the, all the remote participants are actually still muted. Maybe we just we can do it with you know just the. No. no. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, we we just go through it this way, and uh, but we do we do need to find a way to uh, unmute the remote. We so we can they they can unmute themselves. Yeah. So the the, the remote participants, if you want to introduce yourselves, um, please unmute yourself and then introduce yourself briefly. Um, Sophie and Woy, if you are here. Yeah. Hi, um, Kirsten, can you hear me? This is Sophie. Yes, I hear you. Great. Oh, great. Um, yeah, um, so I'm Sophie Howe. I'm currently a data and usability analyst for the USGS. And um, I'm interested in the topic just in general because I'm interested in the FAIR principles um, and applying FAIR principles to all different kinds of research objects. So I'm here to learn more about how we can um, be more FAIR. Thanks. Great. And Jennifer, are you able to um, to unmute yourself and introduce yourself? 
there yesterday, but today is difficult for me. I see that you are room. unmuted, but we cannot hear you at the moment. Okay, that's fine then. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yeah, speak as loudly as you can, please, and we can just barely hear you. Okay, so my name is Jennifer Wei. I am the lead scientist at the Gather Data Center. I'm interested in general uh, for the uh, fair data principles. Okay, great. Thank you all for your introduction and for participating. Um, I So now I need to actually put that arrow and um, just <coughs> click in a different different way. So um, I put together, oh, there's an, another yeah. person. Sorry, just, just keep going. Oh, she, it's, it's, it's okay. I think we, we just go through it this way. Right? Yeah. So it's doing the presenter mode on the other screen. It's like backwards. So it's working on your online, but not here. No, no. It's, oh, it's, it's working it's, online. It's working yeah. online. It's just it's projecting okay. the wrong. So I'll go back to. Sorry. Um, okay. I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint. There is a way to do it. Up at. Oh, yeah, it doesn't screen. show that here. Look, That's look the problem. Okay, let's. Uh, <laughs> the mouse. There we go. Right there. There we go. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting. Yeah, it works on everything. Fantastic. Thanks. So. Uh, I was planning to uh, kind of introduce the topic a, a little bit and give the example of geochemistry, why we we are interested in fair instrumentation and analytic analytical procedures. Um, Leslie uh, would uh, present about the example of OSCOPE and um, the interest in uh, sort of from a major research infrastructure to um, create better uh, best practices and, and standards for analytical lab data exchange. Um, and Chad was going to talk a little bit about uh, what the experiences are in the geophysical sciences on fair and open instrumentation and connection to uh, in instrument softwares. Uh, I don't see Ted here. He had said that he would come by. He is the current co-chair of the RDA uh, working group on persistent identification of instruments. And then I thought to just engage uh, the audience in um, gathering information about what's happening, because clearly we are not aware of everything that's going on with respect to um, instruments and, and uh, analytical procedures and methodologies, how they best document it, and what type of standards, existing protocols we can use uh, to advance access to information about uh, instruments and methodologies in our sciences. Um, for From my perspective and what we have done so far in the community, um, we, we know, first of all, that the acquisition of data in the lab, uh, analytical and experimental, and actually I should really extend it having heard, you know, that we have people who do field work as well, that analytical data are increasingly also acquired in the field already. And it's um, therefore, you know, we, we, we shouldn't really be talking just about lab 
lab data. It's uh, analyses and experiments done uh, in the Earth's environmental and planetary sciences, and it is really pervasive in many fields uh, that these data are acquired, anything from soil sciences to paleoclimate uh, research to volcanology and so on. So it, it is a, uh, a data type that is, uh, is widely um, used and collected in, in our sciences. And clearly when we're talking about FAIR, um, one theme that has uh, been quite um, attracted attention is how do we um, make data interoperable and reusable when those are really very domain specific um, requirements and standards. And reusability of analytical and experimental data um, is, is part of that challenge, I think. Uh, the availability, accessibility, and utility of analytical and experimental data depends to a large part on, on the provenance information uh, in order to be able to properly evaluate um, quality of the data, um, the, the provenance with respect to sample preparation, uh, experimental setup, instrument configuration, um, how was an instrument calibrated, what standards were used in this, what data reduction softwares were used and, and, and procedures. So it's, it's a very complicated field, but uh, nevertheless, we, we need to address this uh, for the community to be able to exchange, exchange these data, uh, even in a broader scale, considering that these data are reused by communities beyond the original um, the, the original collection of the instruments in a certain domain. Uh, and that then also brings uh, up the, the issue of interoperability of these data, which uh, basically is the structuring of these data in a consistent and machine readable format so that we can build more of, you know, networks of these data and plug them in into evolving um, cyber infrastructures. So this pertains to properly describing, identifying, exchanging and citing laboratory in instrumentation data. Uh, and the other aspect clearly is documenting data quality and uncertainty, accuracy, reproducibility, which includes, you know, the documentation of standards, of, uh, of standard deviations, uh, of, you know, the, um, how, many, um, how many standards, how many measurements were done and so on. There's, there's a lot to capture. Um, the issue at the moment is that analytical data is actually increasing rapidly in volume, uh, but still we have many individual data sets. This is a graph I really like that I recently saw that it's an IBM uh, generated graph from one of their websites. And, and it shows, you know, we have all these little droplets of, of data that are produced in labs and, and increasingly in the in the field as well as I said and we need to integrate them we need to create this big pot of, of fluid <laughs> where in the end uh, you know there are different ways of extracting the data and it's these these different pipelines that are, are shown at the bottom um, those to me are the different ways of applying the data of using them in different disciplines and in order to actually support this flow of the little drops into a big pot and then the application in, in different communities or in different research, uh, they require the consistent and, and also easily understandable provenance documentation so we can reuse this data. So at the moment, what I'm really interested in is to 
uh, work towards an interoperable ecosystem of lab and experimental data. Um, and we, we start to have increasing numbers of examples in communities that say we, we want to integrate our data systems more. There are international efforts to do that. Uh, so there, there is a, a need for thinking about best practices and, and protocol standards for analytical and experimental data. Uh, we need these data to be reusable and therefore documented properly. Uh, but what is also uh, relevant, I think, from the perspective of researchers and data curators is that we need better tools to streamline the management of these data. It's currently um, instruments are largely still um, not accessible in, through machine readable interfaces. So instrument settings and so on are still recorded in lab notebooks. Uh, they not integrated into an automated workflow. Uh, and for, for researcher, researchers, it is therefore in a cumbersome and, and time intense process to document uh, how analytical data were, were generated. This makes it, on the other hand, really time consuming for data curators uh, and reviewers of papers to ensure that the right information is there, that it's properly formatted, that it's harmonized for, for getting into that big bowl of, of, uh, of data. And the other thing is that by making instruments more findable and discoverable, uh, we can better share instruments and, and the same thing also for methodologies in, in these analytical labs. Um, obviously, there is urgency uh, related to this because um, I, I see from uh, my repository that uh, we need to know how, what the domain considers as best practices to properly review data to, to ensure that the quality of the data that goes into our repository uh, is, is uh, provided, is guaranteed. Uh, and, you know, Leslie is going to talk a little bit about a major research infrastructure in Australia. And these research infrastructures are growing in other countries as well. We have, for example, EPOS in, in Europe, and they all include laboratory components and look for guidance in the community what standards they should be applying uh, for their data. So that's another uh, urgent need to come up with best practices and data exchange protocols. Uh, and, you know, we also all know that we're building these global data networks and that want to exchange or are built to, to make it easier to access um, all kinds of data. And in order to integrate analytical lab data into these, uh, we need proper documentation. So briefly, I wanted to introduce uh, the One Geochemistry as, as an um, example uh, for the need of fair instruments and analytical procedures. Uh, One Geochemistry is an effort where um, an international group of researchers has come together uh, in order <coughs> to, to establish a global geochemical data network to facilitate and promote discovery and access of uh, geochemical data. Uh, historically, you know, geochemical data are not easily accessed. Uh, it, the, there has been no good strategy for managing these data, and it's typical for a long tail community. Um, Leslie has always called it the thumb drive syndrome because the data of this community easily fits on a thumb drive so everybody manages their data uh, individually rather than having a common facility uh, and therefore the, the development of standards and best practices has always lagged behind. 
But on the other hand, uh, we have had the development of large-scale geochemical databases like EarthChem or GeoRock, and these have really revolutionized, revolutionized data access and the use of data science in geochemistry. So we're now at a stage where there's actually a lot of interest in the research community to have access to large-scale geochemical data sets. Uh, and as I mentioned before, at the level of, of national and, and programmatic dom, um, infrastructures, um, open access policies have triggered the development of new databases. So there is this proliferation of, of databases. Um, I'm going to skip that briefly um, and It is our problems that we have is that these databases that have had so much of an imp impact um, are manually maintained and which is in not scalable and not sustainable into uh, the future. And the technical infrastructures have been customized, not scalable, and we still have a culture in the community that data sharing uh, is, is, is not the normal. The normal is data mining. This all belongs to me. Um, from I'm, I mentioned the challenges for us as data curators, and this is just to show you what, what the implementation of FAIR principle has, has caused for our data curators. You see that submissions of data to EarthChem have quadrupled in the last quarter. And we need more automated ways to check metadata and so on. The current manual procedures don't work anymore. So this is the, the other side of driving the need for, uh, for fair analytical um, metadata. Um, so with one geochemistry, we're trying to build these um, build better practices for fair geochemical data, develop interoperability standards, but also figure out how we can govern these standards. Uh, so we need the participation of the community. So this is one example uh, where analytical information and fair instrumentation is needed. Um, there are old standards. Uh, they are not standards because they don't have a real governance behind them. Uh, we have had an XML schema for data exchange. Um, we've had a, an editor's roundtable, which is now like 12 years ago, that set somehow very high level standards for what should be reported on methodologies in publications, but that's all quite outdated. And again, as I said, it doesn't have a real international endorsement. Um, I want to get to Leslie now, and then we will come back to some questions that we will hopefully be able to, uh, to discuss jointly. So I need to get out of this and figure out. Hey, hey Kirsten. Um, sorry, this is Sophie. Um, we weren't able to see your presentation. Um, the remote attendees weren't able to see your presentation. So if Leslie is going to present, could you help making sure that we can see the presentation as well? Thanks. Oh, I yeah, sorry, I thought it was taken. being presented. All right, let's, yeah. uh, let's go back and I, so we I'm are sharing. we are sharing the screen. They, they... Yeah, and and now that you you are out of the presentation mode, we can see the slides. But um, I think you were in the presentation mode, and what we were seeing was just a blank screen. It might be because there's like two screens or something. Uh, ah, so it's only. Right, okay. So <clears throat> can the people now see our screen? Those who are online? Yes, we can see the slides. Okay, great. I think it was just that issue. Yes, yeah, so let's go into presentation mode. 
So All right, can you still can you still see it now? We're seeing the presenter's view, um, but I think that's close enough. <laughs> um, if if yeah, we don't want to like um, can, make you uh, work on this too for too long. <laughs> yeah, is, is this okay? Will this will this be sufficient for you guys? Yeah, and I think Jennifer's come from as well. This is good enough for us. Thank you. Where is the mouse? Is there not? It's on the other screen. Oh, it's on the other screen. Okay. Yeah, so that was part of the issue. So is it already going to be the culture meeting that causes the problem? No. no. We need to open a new presentation anyway. So. There's a little button up there that says use slideshow. And so that makes the slideshow presentation on both screens. So now are you seeing the slides? So I think. We're, oh, yes. it's so. Oh, it's yeah. Ted. You seen the yeah. slide? Yeah, hey, Ted. <laughs> it looks good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now I, unfortunately I have to get out, so you need that button. Sorry, which, Sorry. Ted, before you go, which button was that? What was it? It's, it's up here. It says use slideshow. It's one of those little icons up there. Okay. Good to know. Uh, yeah. All right. Can everyone see the the slides? Yes. Um. Okay. So I'll just be quick with this because I don't know whether my voice will last. <coughs> but um, in Australia we have something called Oscope, and it's trying to build a National Geochemistry Network. Uh, we're a bit more advanced in the slides it shows, but let's see how we go. And so you can see Oscope has all these um, programs with geodesy, earth imaging as geophysics, composition and evolution, and a virtual core library. And all the material that is collected by all those goes down into a um, data group. Well, that's the goal, and the worst recalcitrants are the jerk canvas because they suffer from the two gig syndrome, and they um, we don't have any repository national repositories like Earthchem to put the data, and so we're making concerted effort to try and um, get into it and see what we can do because if there's no point in spending a fortune on geochemistry, ge geochronology instruments, if the data is sitting on thumb drives and is inaccessible. And at the start of the program, we did a survey amongst the labs that are funded by the research community and conservatively 80% of the data analyzed on those machines never sees the light of day. So it hasn't been easy to fix it. Um, and just like from Western Australia alone, there's all those dots are uh, samples. And I think we've got something like 200,000 geochemical analyses collected by the research community that are effectively inaccessible and only available as Excel spreadsheets, or sorry, as tables or individual Excel spreadsheets. So rather than addressing the problem, at where the researcher has their Excel spreadsheet ready to go into the publication, we want to actually now go back and develop a system that is related to the um, when you're actually capturing it off the instrument. And Oscope has a fair bit of power in this because they are the funders and they are now going to make it a mandatory contribution that if you use one of their instruments, the data off the machine has to be made publicly accessible. And another group um, working in this community has also said that 
if you analyse material on this instrument and don't make it available, you can pay commercial rates. So um, we're getting really heavy on it. So the data component, which is what I run, is the geology, the geochemistry and the geophysics. And the geology is really under control. Um, geophysics is not too bad. They don't suffer from the two gig hard drive because their data is big enough they have to do something with it. But there, and if only Iris would darn well publish it, we're working on a concept of a dirt to desktop so that as you're putting instruments out in the dirt, bang, data goes into data loggers and when you get back to your desktop, there it is. Come on, Chad, will you publish that damn thing? Thank you. Right. And so, yeah, yeah well, no, no, not the audience, just you. Um, and so with geochemistry, we kind of stepped back a little bit and we said, well, geochemistry works on samples. We need to get an identifier system going on the samples, which we've achieved. Um, now we're getting into the data, which is where we're also after PIDs on the instruments. So we know when we fund these instruments, big or small, we know where they are and who's funded them. And we also then want to um, use international standards. And then having sorted that out, look at the inversion tools, some of which are standardized in some techniques and in others, um, researchers feel that that's their own private competitive advantage and they won't share how they're reproducing, or sorry, reducing their data, which as a scientist, I find a little bit annoying, but anyway, that's another story. And so we want to ultimately be able to um, compile this as a geochronology map from hundreds of um, projects, about 15 labs. And so if you're going to do that, you're going to have to have some standardisation and agreement of how you are pulling that data together, which is, again, we're not going to do this in Australia. We need to do it with you internationally. And so we started this geochemistry organisation. It's a collaborative network. We want to um, make access to the facilities. The other really important thing is the fourth dot point, which is um, the instrument manufacturers can pick you off one by one. I hope there's none in the room. But collectively, we can start to try and deal with this dreadful problem in geochemistry, which is that um, you're beholden to the um, proprietary software, proprietary standards used by the instruments. And so then when you go to try and share the data, you're caught out. And so again, we're going to promote participation and probably the word is forced participation. Because another thing we do fund through this infrastructure program is for technical staff to run the instruments. And not only will you not get funding unless the data from your instrument is available, you will not get one of these technicians unless the data that they run on those machines is also publicly accessible. So it's a bit of a carrot and stick, but we're trying to attack this 80% of geochemistry data is just inaccessible. Well, sorry, it never sees the light of day and the other 20% has seen the light of day, but it's still inaccessible. And um, the other problem we've got is that the new instruments coming on board are really upping the volume at which they collect. So we know we've got to get on top of this. We can't keep doing it the way we are. Um, we've got this ageing infrastructure. We have no data management infrastructure as far as I'm concerned. And so we want to actually build these um, tools to make samples and data fair. We want to have trusted repositories of it but we have to be in tune with whatever the international trends are, partly so that we can combine the data, but more importantly, we just don't, this is a really hard problem and we do not want to reinvent the wheel. Um, yeah, that's, they're arguing that if they don't get on top of this, there is no science. And that's just a few more comments. And yes, <coughs> they did get the, Funding It didn't come through till November, so that's why I didn't have the up-to-date version of what their key plans are, but they'll be available soon. But um, 
I can assure you integral to that is the idea that the data comes off the instruments onto a resource. Now from that it can be made publicly accessible but there has to be accountability for data collected with the publicly funded instruments. All right. I can run the mic for you. Okay, great. Um, so I thought it was interesting from our perspective of, you know, to learn what other, that in, in other fields where there is instrumentation used, um, what has triggered openness of that instrumentation and fairness. In, in the lab instrumentation, it's clearly not there. The interfaces are not open, they're not standardized, they're proprietary software running that allows us to, um, or does not allow us to build the right um, ways of automatically capturing information from instruments and uh, getting it into a format that it can be reported back in uh, along with the data. So Chad agreed to say a few words about geophysics. Do you want to, okay, he'll go up to the podium. In seismology, for the last 40 years or so, kind of at the dawn of the digital seismology age, there's never been more than a dozen or so instrument manufacturers, which is quite common. If they're expensive, the good instruments are quite expensive on the scale of 10 to $30,000. So you install hundreds of them, you don't install hundreds of thousands of them. There are thousands and thousands working now that it's been 20 years of development, but it's still a relatively small number of manufacturers, and I think this was key in our discipline, a small number of manufacturers, a very large number of users. And what was really key in our community, which is not necessarily a translatable thing, is that we had a standards body, have had a standards body for a very long time. So about 25 years, we've had the same standards body. And some visionary people very early on said, we need to make a standard. They weren't trying to overrule or get in the way of a business doing what they needed to do to run their business. They were trying to solve the problem of every institution having their own format, which is how early seismology happened. And that wasn't even the fault of manufacturers. That was mostly research groups that they were running their networks and they got it all back to the middle. And they probably had 10 manufacturers equipment out in the field, but in the middle, they needed it common. So there's the University of Washington format, there's the University of Madison format that's all over the place. That was the problem they were trying to solve. Yes. Were the, were the manufacturers part of that standards body? No. No. They've, they often, I'll get to that. They've often, okay. they're, they're almost always invited to these conversations mm -hmm. and they have business reasons that they don't chip in very much. But I'll, I'll get to that. We're, we're actually making quite good headway in there. Um, so that combination of those three things, size of the manufacturer pool, size of the user community, and then a very early standards body drove us to an open data standard, which was the natural, the norm had to be open data for seismology. You can't do good seismology without lots of sharing. That, so that's just also a feature of the science itself. That drove a very pervasive norm that data had to be open. As soon as that data went beyond a single institution to another institution, it needed a common format. We made that format for decades. The manufacturers refused to support it very well until customers start asking and say, we're doing all this work. We want you to do the work. And part of the reason was every time you convert data, it's lossy. So you really want the standard format produced as far upstream as possible. And so customers asking manufacturers, when they're spending hundreds of thousands to many hundreds of thousands of dollars on equipment, they can ask that stuff. And it's gotten to the point now where it's, they don't question it anymore. Probably in the last 10 years, we've reached that point where, yep, they have to support it. It may not be what they use internally, it almost certainly isn't, but they have to be able to write it out in that format. And that has been a major like 
boon to our field. It meant they produced it, the most complete data set, the most raw data set came from the field, and that's the exact same data that we have in our archive and the exact same data that we ship out. That continuity and consistency was hugely powerful. We got so far as the streaming data format that we have streams that same format, and now the manufacturers don't even balk when you say, you have to use that protocol. It's called Seedlink. It's not used outside of seismology. It's not particularly great, but a de facto standard is very, very powerful as a de facto standard, whether it's a wonderful protocol or not. Everybody hates to, it's called Seedlink, but oh, yeah, that's just how we ship mini seed records around. So that we're getting so far into pushing the manufacturers that we were keeping going with it. They have for many years, one of our major problems has been the consistency of getting metadata, the correct metadata for a complex set of instrumentation that's on the ground. And in our field, instrumentation is almost always a sensor and a data logger or a, a small pile of sensors and one data logger. And they're probably not the same manufacturer. We, for years, have asked, like, can you not get them to talk to each other? The data logger doesn't know what the sensor is, doesn't know its model, doesn't know its serial number. How would it, and it's the thing connected to the internet, how would it ever report back up? Even within the small group that they've got, their problem is they're too small. There's not enough people asking for that. So they they haven't solved that problem yet because the people making the sensors are like, well, why would I give up my walled garden advantage. So we haven't quite crossed that border. To address that though, we tried to make a nominal response library about 10 years ago, we started it. Every instrument is nominally the same in that model. There can be a few settings, but it's usually on the order of dozens at the most. So we built a library of it's this kind of sensor, it's that model and it's at this setting, here's the response. It used to be you have this piece of paper still is, you have a piece of paper that has the poles and zeros for the instrument on it, and the, somebody at the data center is supposed to type this into a format that is not for typing. That, of course, doesn't work, and that was a huge breakdown. So we made this nominal library, people building, they just deployed 40 new sensors, they now need to build all this metadata. Instead of looking at all the spec sheets, most of these things are guaranteed to be within their nominal range, you know, it's pretty narrow, the only thing that differs usually is the overall sensitivity in the ground motion sensor. So they use the nominal response and then just go type in the, the, the variation in the total sensitivity. That has been phenomenally successful to the point where we now have multiple software kits that'll, that pull from this library of responses and instrument manufacturers make a new instrument and then actively work with us to get it included into the library. So we've made a lot of headway based on making sure the right the customer has to demand i work at a facility i don't buy seismic instrumentation i just have to deal with it at all so they don't they look at me and they're like yeah good idea the customer has to demand and so that that's a really important that seems rather obvious but us talking to their customers and saying you need to ask for this it'll help you and it'll help us all downstream they're doing that now as a regular thing and the open data norm and that long history of standards have really pushed us pretty far into this. We now have a fair amount of sway over what they're doing. There are a few areas that where they still go off on their own, which totally makes sense, like really ultra low latency, earthquake early warning data packets. That's not something a standards body should attack yet. That's all development and will be proprietary for a long time. That's okay. As long as when that data is 10 seconds old, it can be in the standard format. Did I cover what you wanted me to cover? That was the story of seismology. We're, we're in a good place right now. With that standardized metadata came standardized identifiers. Those are effectively permanent persistent identifiers for that channel of data, that place on the ground. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, That's, that was really useful. Do you have identifiers on the sensors yet? Um, so on the sensors, not sensors. So usually a sensors, a little bit of electronics and a mechanical thing plugged to a data logger. The data loggers, in our case, is where all the, the smarts are. Absolutely, that identifiers get plugged in there. That thing is stamping the data with the appropriate identifiers. If it's not happening right there, it's very, very close. And that was definitely 
driving them to, we don't want to fix this at the data center, you stamp it correctly immediately. You mentioned that the manufacturers don't have a drive to do it with low latency, but they do have it at higher latency. What's going to be the driver to push it to low latency to get them to do it? Because it seems to me as you can, as the technology continues to evolve, that you're going to want the data faster and faster, and therefore you might as well start pushing the data standards now. Yes, so in the standards body, we've had that discussion. So we just went through a revamp of a 25-year-old format. We made the next generation format. And one of the very first questions was, are we going to try to tackle the, the low latency near real, or the real time earthquake detection scenario? Which it ends up, the answer was no. And that's because it, trying to make an archive and exchange format that also is super appropriate for super low latency, like every 10 times a second sending a packet or something. Uh, our, the feeling now is, yes, we should probably start to standardize it. It's still in high flux. Earthquake early warnings are a relatively new thing. We, I think we should let manufacturers, they're not, it's not the sort of thing that, that gets interoperated very much. You're, if you're doing earthquake early warning, you're Washington State collaborating with Canadians and the West Coast. You right. kind of don't care about the data. You have a very focused problem. And it's okay. I think it's a good thing, a healthy thing to let the manufacturers, that's their, their innovation path. They're trying to differentiate themselves, but trying to actually do as best job as they can. And then they do things that are really painful, like use UDP instead of TCP because they're shaving off just a few bytes and you're like, oh, whatever. Let them, we're letting them explore. I think that's healthy. It'll get to the point where that should be standardized, but we're not there yet. Thank you. Anyone else? And so the, the actual procedure of working with the data, that is all on the custom side. I mean, there's not a standard software that indirect, that's written by, yeah. by the researchers. Uh, increasingly, there are large frameworks for doing that. So there's, if you're, doing seismology in Python, you're probably using something called OBSPY, which is the de facto toolkit in seismology. But that, that uh, the, what the researchers are using is kind of a constantly evolving suite of software. Increasingly, they're not writing it all themselves. That, you, of course, used to be the case, but you can't do that anymore. You don't re yeah. reinvent Dask. You don't reinvent the reader that just reads the format. So they're increasingly starting to depend on other people's general modules. And I would say the seismology research community is just getting to the point where they understand the value of reusable modules. Yeah, thanks. I think that's, you know, from, from the perspective of lab instrumentation, that's the software is fairly complex and that's private. I mean, it's you know, commercial software so far and I, I'm, I don't see that there is a lot it's more the procedure that you know which standards do you use how often do you uh, measure that standard how you apply um, interference corrections and so on that so I, I would say that there are um, a good few small number of software packages can have an enormous impact you get the de facto in our case, like cross-correlation codes or something that everyone's going to cite. And if that package takes one good open standard, then if you start, that, that can be really useful as leverage to drive manufacturers to say, that's what I'm doing with this data. I have to do that analysis. Build me a bridge to that. It's, it's a useful mechanism. And that has worked. We build 30 old formats because the software still takes it. You know, that's, I mean, this, this to me is a, it's a good example, you know, how uh, we, we could potentially address our, our issues. Now, you said you started to have identifiers, but more for the data loggers than for the actual sensors. So I thought, you know, in, in, I know that uh, a number of activities have been going on in 
in smaller communities to try and build registries of analytical instrumentation. So it, the, um, the purpose there is more to know who is doing what type of analytical work. But I think, you know, we, we have been thinking of persistent identifiers for instrumentation and found that there are quite a number of challenges for analytical instrumentation that kind of keeps changing because of modifications that are necessary for different types of analytical procedures and so on. So I just thought it would be good if Ted, who is now sharing, uh, co-chairing the PID working group uh, for persistent identification of instruments, tells us a little bit about, because they just finished up their 18 months work on, on that issue. Uh, issue that we learn a little bit about that and where that stands and what it could potentially or if it can be applied to lab instrumentation as well what your perspective is okay i actually i can show a couple slides oh great and i i leave it to you <laughs> not going there right were there any questions to chat from the um, from the remote participants? Pardon? No, I was just asking the remote participants if they had any questions for chat while we're setting up. remote participants, if you have any questions, please feel free to chime in now or anyone else in the room. Oh, okay, there we are. So we want to do this. this. Okay, so I'll, we won't, I won't look at, we won't look at this for a minute because of GML and I know it's scary. Um, Pardon? Yeah, I'll do that in a second. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about this work that's going on at RDA and then put it in a bigger context when we get to these slides. Um, the Resource uh, Research Data Alliance, RDA, is an international group. Most of you people here are probably familiar with it that deals with a wide variety of, of, uh, of data issues in a wide variety of disciplines. It's uh, broader, much broader than earth science. Um, you know, particle physics, health, all, all kinds of research data. And um, they recently had a, uh, a group, as Kristen mentioned, um, uh, interested in identifiers, persistent identifiers for instruments. I, uh, I happened to drop in on one of their meetings and then I somehow became a co-chair of the group. <laughs> a typical sort of volunteer. If you show up, you volunteered. But, um, they, uh, we have a white paper that's coming out, uh, published, you know, written by that group about their process. Um, basically, what they decided to do is to use um, DOIs uh, published uh, by Datasite for um, uh, as I, persistent identifiers for instruments. And the reason that they're doing that is because uh, the data site, uh, the data site infrastructure um, is uh, well established and working pretty well. And um, you know, for for a group to come in and it's sort of like a little bit like uh, IGSN or, or CSAR back in the day sort of came in, but since since that time, um, you know, the infrastructures for dealing with identifier registries have gotten much bigger. Uh, data site now has 18 million identifiers. Uh, Crossref has something like, I think it might even be a billion uh, DOIs uh, in, in its system. So these infrastructures are really good at handling large uh, numbers of things. And it turns out that the data site metadata schema is um, flexible enough to, to, to hold most of the information that uh, 
needs to be associated with these identifiers. Uh, here or there, there's a couple things that might, you know, the, the biggest thing that needs to change in DataCite is um, adding a, a resource type, uh, which is a code list in DataCite. So adding a resource, a resource type of uh, instrument is basically, you know, what it boils down to in terms of changing the data site uh, uh, metadata schema. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also a member of the data site metadata working group, and, and there's a large, dis there's a significant discussion going on there about um, extending in somehow the data site um, schema to handle to have specializations for particular resource types that that may or may not happen um, but but there is a discussion going on at data site and of course the reason that we that that people want it to happen is because data site is a robust infrastructure um, the reason the data site doesn't want it to happen is because it means that they need to start managing essentially extensions, custom extensions to their metadata schema with, you know, 18 million things and, and it, it's tricky pretty fast. So the, the important point that I wanted to make about this today, like you may be some, in some cases you're sitting there and saying, how can data site actually work for instruments, right? Because instruments have all this custom stuff and they have settings and they have this and that. Um, so in this, in this group, um, one of the ideas that that is, is is in this paper is a sort of division of of metadata land between identifier metadata and and some other metadata which is for the thing that you're identifying and data site is really a uh, a metadata schema for identifier metadata you know it doesn't really have much in it which is related to data sets even right i mean i showed yesterday if some of you were in the fair uh, discussion that um, like temporal and spatial extent, which is ubiquitous in a lot of our spatial, uh, our geo, uh, earth, earth oriented data sets that exists in the data site schema, but it's essentially un unused. So, so the idea of this RDA group is to use data site for identifier metadata. Okay. And the other thing that, that, uh, let me go here. The other thing that um, data site does, and this is not the right picture for this, but it's a slide I happen to have, is it provides information about identifiers and then information about relationships between identifiers. And the code list that data site uses for describing types of relationships is really good. And uh, this is some some examples of it. So if we have an instrument in in data site land, it would be called a resource. And that resource can have, it has some identifier and it has some other set of related identifiers that are related in various ways. It turns out that on this slide, the ones that we, that we sort of, some that we need are here, like for instance, has metadata. So if you have an instrument and you have instrument metadata for that instrument written in some schema, which is, which is which works for that instrument, and now that instrument gets an identifier. That identifier goes into data site, and the I, the identifier for the instrument metadata is linked to it using a has metadata relation. And so when you find that identifier for the instrument, you then go follow the has metadata thing, and you get the metadata in whatever uh, schema. Um, is appropriate for the community that's associated with that instrument. Um, it could be that you're using some uh, more standard instrument. You know, my favorite uh, instrument metadata standard is SensorML uh, because I think it's it's very it's very general. It's um, it's a softly typed metadata standard. So in my world, you would have an instrument pointing to metadata uh, for that instrument in SensorML. But if you have a community that has a different metadata, you know, uses a different metadata schema for a certain type of instrument, then that, that schema might be there. Or if you're in a semi-sophisticated um, infrastructure, you might be able to content negotiate and get that instrument metadata in some 
you know, a PDF of the uh, of the specification sheet that Chad's talking about, or something like that. But so, in in the discussions that this group had, we kept sort of sliding down the icy slope towards my instruments are really complicated, and the metadata for them is really complicated. And one of my uh, uh, roles and that was to try and keep pulling us back up that slippery slope and saying, um, I'm sorry, but this is the identifier metadata. It's really simple and, it's, and it can be standard. So I'm gonna, Sophie, you can hear me, right? Sophie might not really be there. Okay, cause I'm gonna, I need to, Kristen, can you hand me that plug? For some reason, my battery has really gotten crazy this week. Yeah. Hmm? Hey, Taz, sorry, I was muted. I can still hear you fine. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so quick question on, I'm imagining that this uh, group, the data site and instrument discussion group is broad. So just confirm for me, if you will, I'm assuming somebody from NIST is likely there. Somebody from material science perhaps is there. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Got it. The, the, the reason I'm asking is because, as many of you in the room know, there are there there is work exactly in this space in those other communities. No, not what I mean. What I mean in this space is that figuring out how to get an identifier on an instrument and the metadata and then linked into a broader identifier system that is happening it's not clear to me though that that other instrument groups are looking at data site as the way to go well, so yeah. you're going to have a million things and you're going to try and run it on your you know your ibm 286 in the closet it's going to get to be a problem Right, so data site is robust, and of course, data site doesn't have a business model for this, right? Except people will be buying, maybe buying DOIs for instruments, but you know, they've still got problems. But there's a lot of them. Am I? Do I have a time limit? No. <laughs> oh. I mean, we're going to leave some time for this. Yeah. Stuff. Okay. So I'm just going to go quickly through this. But just to. To respond to, to that, I think this is one of the challenges with uh, working with the manufacturers on opening up software and interfaces. I had an um, interesting little round table happened at AGU um, where manu one manufacturer was there because they now see it as a competitive advantage to become open. And you know, we, we were the earth scientists there in the room and saying, you know, what we wanted. And they said, well, if we work on, on this, we need to be much broader. We need to bring chemistry in and genomics. And, you know, there's all these different fields. And that I find as, you know, one of the challenges for us to actually drive this forward in, in uh, standards for for the earth science community that's using analytical instrumentation is the challenge how are we going to actually integrate that into a bigger picture yeah so this idea of having identifier metadata essentially pointing to some more detailed stuff is also exists in csar right they have something called registration metadata and then they have something called descriptive metadata or something like that or the sample the, i don't know what it stands for so CSR is a system for a sample registration and started an effort to create persistent identifiers for physical samples. Uh, that really is the IGSN. And that, you know, is, CSR is basically a tool for investigators, sp specifically in the US community, to get these identifiers and to manage their sample metadata and so on. But the IGSN is that persistent identifier uh, used for samples. Right. Yeah. So this, this idea of having a small amount of 
metadata, which is associated with an identifier, and then pointing to something bigger is very common. Um, and this is uh, one. This is uh, the ISO metadata standard for acquisition, uh, 19115-2, that some of you may have heard of, and we recently revised that uh, standard. So this is some work that happened maybe I don't know five years ago or so. Um, and this is the acquisition part of ISO. And up here in the middle, there's this thing that says MD metadata. So that's like a metadata record for a data set or something. Okay, it's got all the stuff, the identif the FA and I stuff is sort of up in there. And if you want to understand the instrument, it's, it's connected to that, okay. And here's a, a platform and an instrument. And this stuff in the ISO is really what I would call now the identification, the, the identifier metadata. So for a platform and an instrument, and these things were actually the same as they were written originally in 2005 or so, all that you basically have is a citation and an identifier and a description, and then either a type for the instrument or a sponsor for the instrument. So this is like the registration uh, metadata piece in, in IGSN or in CSAR, and it's like the, it's like the data site piece in this, this RDA idea. The red stuff here are things that we added to this standard uh, in the last revision. And basically what they, they're, they're just additional attributes. And they say, here's the type of this additional attribute and here's a pointer to it. And a, a record can be anything. So this is, this is the same thing as a pointer to the more detailed metadata for this platform or for this instrument in whatever format it's in. And this says, this is the format that it's in, and here it is. So you could say, this thing is a parameter list from SensorML, and here's a link to it, or here it is. It's, this is gonna be a link too. So, so the same idea of having simple identifier metadata associated with a pointer of some kind to, um, uh, to more detailed metadata in some custom community. I mean, this is stuff that Kirsten and I have been pretending to be disagreeing on for a long time. This is the generic, this is the shared infrastructure piece, and this is the community, you know, the community specific piece. And in the ISO standard, um, some people said we have multiple sensors on our instruments. So we added in this sensor thing. So you have a platform, you have instrument, and you can have multiple sensors on that instrument. Same idea here, simple identifier metadata with, with pointers to more detailed stuff in, in community specific, or in, it could be a standard, it could be another ISO record of some kind, it could be sensor ML, it could be a spec sheet uh, that describes this instrument. One other thing that I'll just mention since I, opened up these slides and reminded myself of it. Um, sometimes instruments break. I mean, I know in seismology they don't, but um, uh, in, you know, in the satellite business, channels break or they get flaky or all kinds of things happen. So another thing we added in here is this instrument instrumentation event list. This is in 19115-2, uh, where you have a list of things that went wrong uh, with your instrument and how you fix them. So this is sort of the instrument, the instrument history that we introduced into this. This is part now part of the of the um, of the international standard for metadata. And you know these are sort of the kinds of events that you might have. And um, you know you have a list of these things. And there again, these each of these citations here has an identifier built into it. And an identifier is included. So events that happen to your instruments also have identifiers. And these things can be associated at any level of that hierarchy, platform, instrument, or sensor. And um, sometimes there are events that cover a certain temporal extent. This is an ISO extent object. So this has time and space in it. So if, if this event happened over some duration in time, um, and, and of course, if it's a if it's a mobile instrument, it could also be over some extent in space. Uh, that's sort of what goes in here. So, so 
you know, this this is yesterday in the sample metadata. We were talking about sort of some core stuff that might be useful that could come from that we could do the core stuff in a standard way, and maybe this is one of those might be a helpful thing to think about either to use or to adopt or or adapt, you know, for uh, instrument histories. So those are the those are the things that I. And I, this is my doc. So how far have these identifiers been implemented in the science community? Are they being adopted? I mean, I, I see, you know, for us in the world of lab instrumentation, a big hurdle to actually change the practices. And I need to communicate the benefit of, you know, getting a an identifier for your instrument documenting it in in some way that is is accessible and exchangeable yeah um you know i think that there's a lot of informal um uh instrument identification stuff that that goes on in the scientific community in in nasa and noaa uh where i did a lot of work um for a while uh, they tend to have a few instruments that last a long time, in, certainly in the satellite business. So if I say I'm using um, AMPS or E, or I'm using uh, MODIS, everybody here knows what those are. Those are persistent identifiers for instruments that in, in that business, everybody knows what that means. And there's only three MODIS instruments or two or three instruments, So, and they, they think that they're the same, you know, so, but... And then if you're talking about the airborne guys who are flying around in airplanes or, you know, the seismic experiments, the sort of Pascal stuff where you have, a, you know, maybe you have a thousand instruments, you know, it, most of those people, well, this isn't quite true in seismology, but in the, in the atmosphere chemistry stuff, they sort of given up on identifying things because they have these PIs that are running around with screwdrivers and stuff, right. adjusting the instruments every day or while they're flying or building them while they're flying in some cases. So, so you know, identifier management and the revision questions that come up in DOIs and data sets that get revised or um, long lived data sets that start out and then go for a long time, all of those revision problems still exist. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm actually at this point trying to figure out do we, you know, what are the benefits of persistent identifiers for instrumentation in the lab or can we live without it? You know, is it more important to actually, you know, identify the the methodologies, the procedures that have been used? You know, one one question that that I have and you know, really my Everything I say is, is more or less a question to the audience. You know, what do you know? What do you do? What are the problems in, in, in your world? Um, so we, we're A, trying to make it easier for researchers to report on their methodologies and, you know, basically identifying a certain process that is currently repeat, uh, repeatedly reported in publications. There's always that analytical procedure in, in a paper and it's the same thing <laughs> over and over again with maybe you know different values of standards being measured as part of the procedure and so on. So that I mean is 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 that a, a way to have an identifier for that analytical procedure and then refer to it on on you know in, in this case, in the ISO case, you can deal with that using this thing here, which is called scope. So this is a this is a code list, and it gives you the scope of this acquisition information. So if you're in in a in an atmospheric composition experiment and you're flying instruments for a month on different airplanes or the same airplane different times in space, and those instruments change as a function of time. Then that the time, the time that this platform and instrument were used to create this data set is in this is in this scope uh, guy right here. 
So, I mean, it seems to me that, you know, there is a lot of structure already that we can reuse to define profiles for analytical lab instrumentation. Um, I'm also not very familiar with other kind of standards. I know there's a provenance metadata standard. Um, what is needed for a community specific um, profile to to reuse those type of, of structures? I mean, we, we obviously need to have community, I mean, the disciplinary community to agree on what is needed to re, you know, what level of information is needed to reuse data that are to trust the data, right? The the quality of the data. I remember very long ago, I think it was my first ESIP meeting where I was in a session, uh, <laughs> in a session in, um, God, it was New Mexico. You ran a session on uncertainties and data quality, I think. It was the all day one. Yes, right, oh, intense. <laughs> there were only, there were only a few of us. <laughs> but you know, how can we integrate with those? Well, yeah, I think in terms of this RDA group, you know, uh, without a doubt, the RDA group would love to have some use cases and some demonstrated. You know, the problem is that in many scientific organizations, the 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 reuse of of a metadata structure conversation goes like this. You know, oh, this doesn't do what I need let's make up our own, right? And then you make it up and then you turn out that you've got overlap of 90% anyway. So, I mean, what my, I mean, I've been working on this ISO stuff for a while, but my, um, you know, I work a lot with different scientists in different communities and try and make a presentation like this and say, you know, is this a useful starting point? And um, I think, taking some interesting, it could be a geological sample example or a sample from, from you know, some satellite data from somewhere. And you know, yesterday, I think in this room even, we had these amazing descriptions of the lineage work that's going on in the Global Change Information um, Service. And um, you know, having that kind of thing where you could have an experimental result, go back to the instruments and, and the identifiers for them and have some good examples of how these identifiers get used, then, uh, you know, that's, I mean, the adoption problem is is not a simple one. I, you know, I appreciate what Chad says. If, yeah. if you've got software that reads this stuff and people, you know, you can use the software as the gateway drug to, uh, to the standard. I mean, that's what happened basically with JSON and JSON-LD. Um, so, you know, but good examples, I think, from specific communities. And I, I know that the RD, do you know uh, Marcus Stolker? Yes. Yeah, so Marcus is the, and Rolf Kahn, I think is his last name, were the two people that started that group. Uh, and I think they're light source guys. Um, but, well, they, they also come from, I mean, they both, I think, Marum or Marvin, um, have the big net. Oh, okay. There was something, yeah. Anyway, some nice, some nice use cases and examples, yeah. and 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 um, difficult examples would be interesting, like experiments where instruments are changing as a function of time. That sounds, that sounds more like a project, <laughs> major project. Maybe, maybe you want to stand at the front and discuss. <laughs> So I'm going to make another motherhood statement, which I'm sure you're not going to want to argue with. <laughs> and maybe it will be useful, but you ask a question about uh, why, what you're trying to gauge the value of us assigning the identifiers. Yeah. I would make the very obvious plug for the sooner the better. Everything that, so she mentioned dirt to desktop, it, that's an initiative that we tried to do where you should field works a pain. You can solve a little bit of that problem by automating equipment <laughs> setup and stuff. The reality is it's painful all the way through. All the data translation of migration, 
and metadata that goes with it, the sooner it's in an appropriate state, the better in all cases. So that's a painful lesson that seems obvious, but you can't make it too soon. So a sensor that knows how to self-report and knows its identifier, that's ideal. So you, it may not look very valuable from the, when the manufacturer is like, oh, come on, I have to make this thing do this. It's hugely valuable because of all the downstream stuff. You won't regret it. <laughs> yeah, my, my statement of that motherhood is identify early and identify often. Yeah. And um, I mean, you know, if the we had the OGC here, you know, sensor ML and sensor web uh, standards and sensor observation services are like completely well established standards in and, and the sensor observation service is really for for managing networks of sensors. I mean, so there's a lot of ground has been covered by those guys in in the, the field implementations. And, um, you know, Mike Botts, who um, was the inventor of that, you know, it's, it's been used, it's sort of moved into the 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 dark side and sort of the NGA side um, since he created it, but it's being used a lot in situations that we don't, we don't know very much about. <laughs> Like two points. Firstly, what you've said with Mike Botts on sensor ML, because um, Simon Cox was involved in that, and Mike actually came out to Canberra, and he worked with Irina, who's floating around here somewhere, and we made sure that the modifications to sensor ML, which was mainly for you know in, in situ sensors or floating things, could also apply to laboratory instruments. So that was done about ten years ago. And the second thing with um, Chad, I totally agree with what you said because you've been helping us. We've done this data rescue project in Australia on, Libra, on M MT and passive seismic. And both groups independently said to me the pain in the ass was trying to get the metadata from the field because that's virtually gone. And so we were able to document this and we've just landed a project which is about you know, field instrument capture that works on Android phones, open source. And we've got instrument pools for MT and passive seismic. And the conditions of you hiring it out is that you have this tool to capture the agreed metadata. And now all we want is the international community to come up with what is that field-based metadata. Yeah, one of, I mean, I, I know that we, we are at the end of, of uh, the session, um, but one of the questions that, that Leslie and I had actually um, thought of is, you know, is ESIP the right place to work on this further, or does it need a different place like, like RDA that's more multidisciplinary? Both. Well, we've got Chad, because I wrapped you in the other night for obvious reasons. If we were to do something like this, would the seismology geophysics group be interested in it? At the moment, we were just starting it out with the laboratory, but the pattern's the same. We, we have a standards body, so we might want to put it in a context, but the problems are the same. And so even though we have identifiers in our community, we know we need to probably be expressing our metadata in alternate formats like sensor ML for a much broader community input and also using persistent identifiers that are more transportable. So yes. Do you need a sensor We do not. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't touch anything and this thing suddenly starts. No, I, was, I was still sharing mine. Oh, maybe maybe that's what it was. I mean, I, I you know, appreciated Melissa's comment about NIST. I think it's a really important step to, 
involve you know or large organizations like NIST and I wonder if NOAA and others who I mean well, organizations that run these type of instruments right so and I think for example so so there are there are other uh, domains where they've solved some of this right um, and others are struggling in the same place the idea of potentially you know you're gonna have different metadata at some point but the idea of potentially converging on some points of standardization where there then could be interoperability in the identifier system around some of this will, will be kind of brilliant. So soils are there, the phenotyping, uh, agri uh, so, so ag data right now, they're working on this, but the materials space, materials in general, uh, because the instrumentation, both lab-based and elsewhere, they're working on this right now. So anyway, I just, I'll leave that for your thought. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, don't want to hold the coffee break up any. Cool, thank you everyone. We'll be closing the session now.